Welcome back to number two, Progressive Talk with Dave and Josh. Dave, if you don't know, is from Progressive Resistance Media, PRM. So definitely check out his channel and subscribe to grow the voice. And of course, your host here, Josh from New Progressive Voice. Welcome back, Dave. Hey there, Josh. How you doing? Doing all right. All right. So we've got so- our, quite a few things we'd like to cover today. We'd like to talk about the... CNN Town Hall with Marianne Williamson, Andrew Yang, and the Fox Town Hall with uh, Bernie Sanders. So let's start there. Marianne Williamson, I know you posted a couple videos uh, regarding your thoughts about her, her performance. Yeah. Would you like to share some of those here or any additional thoughts? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I thought she did a great job. She, she had a strong showing. Uh, she she kind of won me over. It was my first experience uh, listening to her about anything. And she brought up some uh, pretty interesting topics. She spoke out about, uh, against aristocracy and the oligarchy and corrupt capitalism. And, you know, that's pretty awesome to hear that on CNN. But she had something mm-hmm. called the Department of Peacemaking that got my attention. Uh, right. She talked about how we're about waging war. We have all these departments of war. What about a department of peacemaking? What about waging peace? So yes, I like she, that. Yeah, that, that was a really, really fresh, uh, you know, uh, idea. I like that. And she had talked about the policy of love, not fear. At one point, she had said that the problem is those who hate hate with conviction. Conviction is a force multiplier, and so we need to love with just as much, if not more, conviction. What was her stance on Israel? It seemed like it was quite hardline, right? Like yeah, it was actually it was actually uh, pro Palestine, and she talked about how we okay. haven't had a pro Palestine president since Jimmy Carter. Right, right, so, and that kind of gives you an idea of how long we've had that um, type of relationship that we currently have with Israel, letting them get away with things that we wouldn't let any other nation get away with. Exactly, and a well, Jew, she's Jewish, she's a Jewish woman, so that says oh, a lot too. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. it's just some right, context right. there. Yeah. She says, the alliance of the U.S. and Israel is extremely important. It should be extremely important to all of us. If I'm president of the U.S., the world will know our greatest ally is humanity itself. Hmm. Yep. She spoke (laughs) a lot. She knows how to talk. I know. She's a wonderful speaker. Um, uh, She talks a lot about humanity and love, and she really has a whole angle. And she writes books, uh, you know, like a lot of self-help books and stuff like Mm -hmm. that. She was a couples counselor for 35 years. So she speaks from a whole different viewpoint uh, that's kind of refreshing to hear in politics where we could use some love, we could use some humanity. So she has an interesting angle. And yeah, she reminded me a little of Jill Stein. And um, she did also remind me sort of a combination of candidates, uh, a little bit of Bernie, a little bit of Tulsi, uh, even a little bit of Yang. It was really interesting. Yeah, Uh, she sort of embodied all those different candidates. There was one other thing I, that she brought up that did concern me a little bit. Um, your thoughts on her not being fully for Medicare for all? Uh, yeah, that, that was probably the main thing that stuck out for me was that she's uh, for Medicare for all public option. It's just I'm running into this with so many candidates and it's unfortunate that she's in that camp. I don't know why she would be when a lot of her rhetoric uh, and policy stances are very progressive. They're very populist. So mm-hmm. I don't really, I, I honestly don't understand why she's for it. I'm trying to pull from memory what she said. Uh, but I, I I just can't find any, I couldn't find any reasoning when I did watch it. I couldn't find yeah. any reasoning why. Yeah, I don't think she really provided a very strong argument why she preferred Medicare public option versus going right for Medicare for all. I do know that a number of the candidates, uh, Buddha Judge, Yang, among them, Warren, are using the the argument that would be a much smoother transition and would get the support of the American people, give an opportunity to bring, bring prices down, not have such a dramatic impact on the health care insurance industry that could impact the economy. So that's what their typical argument is. Yeah, those are about- uh, those are valid concerns, but I just got to make a point here uh, that Bernie Sanders uh, Medicare for all that covers everybody uh, is actually has a four year rollout period. So, right, right. I mean, OK, is four years not enough for some people? Is it going to cripple our way of life? I mean, I, how much time mm-hmm. do we need for rollout? Four years sounds about right. It sounds generous even in some contexts, but I, I just right. don't I don't get that. 
I think one of the other mis notions or, or misconceptions about the public option is people believe that it's med it's actual Medicare for all when it's not. I know it yep. really is private insurance. It's just a different form of private insurance in the like of Medicare for all. Agreed. And so you are essentially uh, putting money into the insurance companies, you know, the middleman right. that really doesn't need to be there. There's no point of it existing, making money off of sick, you know, people that are sick, making money, money off of sickness, basically, which is the opposite of what we want to achieve with the healthcare industry, which is promoting health. Exactly. It's totally unethical what they're doing. One of the points she brought out, uh, which is a major part of her campaign, what she calls join the evolution, is reparations. Oh, any thoughts on her approach on that or a policy stand on reparations? I think she wants to set forth $500 billion. Yeah, I think oh. that's the updated one. It was $100 billion at one time. I, I guess it is like about $500 billion over. Is it over 10 years? Is it 15? It's something like that. It's um, anywhere from, I think she had said anywhere from 100 to 500, that she initially started with 100. But the right. more she spoke with uh, leaders within that movement, called it's called ADOS, which is... Um, African Descendants of Slaves, ADOS. The okay. more she spoke with that, the more she understood that she wanted to also okay. give them an opportunity to okay. put forth what they felt was a appropriate you know, amount. Okay, yeah, so that, that, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, and I, I'm totally for it. Uh, you know, Ronald Reagan even had uh, his hand in this, in reparations, when he gave uh, reparations to Asian Americans for what mm -hmm. we did back in World War II by putting them in American concentration camps. Japanese uh, Americans, Japanese, to be precise. Sorry. Right, That's exactly. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, and there's been other cases of, of us giving reparations to uh, uh, marginalized people in American society. So why not? What, why are we hesitating about the descendants of slaves. I don't know why we're. I don't. I, just I don't think that a lot of it has to do with um, people often may think that we've come far enough in society there really isn't institutionalized racism still in America, and they often leave out the historical part uh, where the African American community is rooted into and from which they receive their sustenance. Really, if you think about it, it really is. The roots of everything, you know, and I think she really spoke well to that. And she, she went through the she history did. of how the United States at one point did promise descendants of slaves 40 acres and a mule. And they didn't. And the United States did not follow through on that. So I think that's why a lot of people don't have an appreciation for the history of racism in America as it as it applies to African-Americans, what they had gone through and how that led up to where we are today. So, well, sir. But uh, she did. I think she did a good job speaking to that, and she was very persuasive. I think she's probably the most persuasive speaker I've, he I've heard up to now. She is good. Uh, that that is speaking on um, us moving toward reparations. So absolutely. And so, in the summary, uh, what is your overall thoughts? Where where would you rank her right this time? Would you say, or where did you rank her prior? Let's say in the top five or top twenty-one candidates running, <laughs> versus after seeing the CNN town hall. Um. Yeah. She 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 entered my top five uh, after okay. the CNN town hall. So I would probably put her at four or five. Mm -hmm. Um. I think she's really important to the national dialogue, such as with reparations. Uh, you know, the Department of Peace uh, coming from a whole different angle uh, with love, compassion and humanity in our politics, infusing that into our politics. Uh, but, yeah, she she broke the top five for me. What about you? Most definitely. I had caught eye of her uh, early on back in January, February when she came on. And right, right away, I was appealed to her message. Um, and I would say that the CNN town hall just strengthened that even more. Her performance strengthened that for me. So definitely she's in the top five, in my opinion. Nice. Okay, uh, let's move on to Andrew Yang. What are some of the highlights and your thoughts about his, his performance? <laughs> I just I thought about the moment I want to lead with was he, he basically had a Jeb moment. I don't know if you caught that. Oh, 
Right, did, right. Did you catch it? Like he was talking about what he was, uh, what was he talking about? Medicare for all. He said, I'm for Medicare for all public option. And he said, is there an applause line for that? And I'm just like, <laughs> did you just do a jeb? Like, <laughs> please clap for Andrew Yang. Uh, so you I know, <laughs> I'm, I was curious though, because it, when I first saw that, I was thinking that exactly what you're thinking, you know, but then the more I watched that segment, the more I was wondering if he was trying to convey to the audience that he knows this, you know, like he's implying that it's all staged, you know. So where's yeah. my applause for what he thinks CNN would totally be behind, you know? And so okay. I don't know. Maybe was I'm reading too much into humor? it. Was he stabbing at humor there? Was yeah, kind of, okay. kind of. Okay. I think he was kind of surprised because you know here he is on the CNN set okay. and. Nobody's applauding to the public option. What 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 gives here? <laughs> yeah, which is kind of which is kind of weird because it's kind of a centrist position to take. It usually I, I would assume it would get one anyways. Um, mm -hmm. The public yeah. option. I don't know. That's just what I think. But uh, but yeah, the, CNN tried to do their crap with like framing Andrew uh, with him being you know a darling of the far right white nationalist mm -hmm. movement, and they tried to tack him onto that, and that was pathetic. Someone asked him, someone who worked for the DNC asked him, uh, why run for president in a field where you have the least amount of experience? Look who's mm -hmm. president. Look at who's president and ask that question again. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. So, yeah, I don't know. I think he did good. He did very well. He did. Uh, I give him an eight out of ten uh, for okay. CNN Town Hall. Mm -hmm. What about you? Yeah, I gave him a pretty high score. I thought he did. Excellent. Uh, at least a nine out of ten. Um, I think he conveyed all his message. My my big concern him with him going in is he might overstress the UBI and make it too much of his the town hall. But he actually peppered it. You know, he kind of peppered it throughout the the, the his uh, his town hall. So that was good. Uh, and I agree. I do think that especially the first couple of people asking him questions, they seemed like they were possible plants. The first lady, she had asked about automation and should we not limit that, or restrict the advancement of automation? Should we not value human workers over automation? Obviously, she was coming from an angle of knowing who he is and what his stances right. are. I mean, he's yeah. popular enough, though, isn't he, to have a few people know about him. He's pretty big online, if anywhere. So there's still, you know, it's still plausible that people know about him. Uh, yep. They weren't all plants, or it wasn't all staged. I mean, these town halls are kind of, uh, they have to be somewhat staged. Uh, I don't think they're, obvi they're obviously not 100% organic at all. Like, they're, yeah. I think I think the question that the person in the audience asked, you know, the, the, the presenter knows what's incoming there, and she knows what her, like, response to that is. And so it, it's definitely choreographed, uh, but... I don't know. And whenever mm. they're in D.C., remember, whenever they're in D.C., they're going to have political operatives. They're going to have lobbyists, mm. they're have yeah. you know, people who work for the DNC. Uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah, you kind of have to expect that if it's in D.C. Mm. Excellent. Yeah, good, good points. What were your thoughts about his plans to monitor malicious speech in the U.S.? Do you feel that that is bordering on questionable free speech or free press issues? Do you do you feel that at all, or do you feel like he he walked through that pretty easily with no no real problems? Do you think some people might perceive that he is, you know? Yeah, I need to. I need. I think I need a refresher on this one. What was the what was his? Uh... Uh, so essentially, he says we we have to be able to sort out people who are maliciously informing the American people, and that to me is a much greater d danger than we face now. And so he is setting forth a policy where he's going to give fines to media outlets that are spreading fake news, I guess. He says here, it's given Trump has repeatedly and fervently maligned what he calls the fake news throughout his White House tenure. Yang's view is deeper than just media, includes people who are willfully misleading the public. So if they can do that, why can't we? This is he talking about the UK, where viewers of BBC can petition an ombudsman who can then take issues under review. Right now, we're on a verge of a difficult time, so Americans can't trust what we see. So he wants to give fines. He wants to give uh, reviews, peer reviews against journalists or people spreading, quote unquote, 
misinformation. So I wasn't really sure how that came across to people, even the way I felt about it when I was listening to him, because what are your thoughts on that? Do you believe corporate media or any person even coming on YouTube has some responsibility for their content? And should they held, be held accountable if they knowingly present information that they know to be untrue, fake or false? Man, that's such a loaded question. Uh, I mean, yes, in my heart, yeah. I want, I, I'd like there to be some discouragement. Like, I think, I don't know what he, what his goal is, but the goal should be is to discourage that from happening. How do we discourage that from happening? Make a penalty, make a fine for it. Um, public shaming, I don't, you know, I mean, as far as online. Mm -hmm. So I, I understand, like, discouraging this kind of activity, mm -hmm. but I honestly don't know how far that should go uh, as far as, like, the punishment. Is a fine the furthest it should go? I, I, I honestly don't know. I, I definitely, I don't know. It seems like a sketchy territory. Yeah. Think, does it okay. sound sketchy to you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, Each, I mean, come on. So much of news is propaganda anyway, if you think about it. Totally. Um, I think there's a difference between someone who sits behind the camera and just tells you a set of events versus what we see today in corporate media outlets, which is essentially commentaries and propaganda spinning and spin mastering and all that doctoring and politicizing different topics and issues. I don't even know how you get out of that, that we're so deep into the forest with that in modern times that I don't know how you can untangle that from, it's like the substance of the very media itself, whether it be social or otherwise, it's just who we are today. People are a lot more opinionated and have ideas about what things are. I mean, if you think about a hundred years ago, even the Bible, uh, People believed in that and framed news around that. You know, sure. God ordained this, God did that. And today it's a different, you know, context, but people still frame based upon their set of beliefs. What one perceives to be true may not necessarily be true for someone else. Right. So, but, but the, I don't know how you can, you know, we should be able not to. Not really sure. Sorry. No, I said the goal should be to protect the speech mm. here in America, regardless of how it's framed regardless of how it's packaged, uh, let people make up their own minds if it's propaganda right. or if it's not propaganda. You know, it's like, we don't want to be legislating free speech. I understand if it's hate speech, it's different, but free speech, we definitely don't want to be right. infringing right. upon care about the Constitution at all. So it's... Yeah. And then he talked about decriminalizing heroin. Yeah, the, uh, the decriminalizing opiates. Uh, he wanted to decriminalize uh, uh, users, not drug dealers, in, in the context of which one. So, like, like we just throw users right into jail, which is crap, okay? It's just we should be getting them directly into treatment. But so, so that's the whole point of decriminalizing opiates. Uh, we, we're we're going to get the users into jail. Uh, not in the jail, sorry. <laughs> the users into treatment as soon as possible uh, mm -hmm. and just change the framing on the situation uh, stop looking at small time users as big time criminals and get them the help they need and deserve instead of throwing them into the criminal justice system where they're just going to get lost and they're not going to get the help they need and it's going to make the situation uh, intrinsically worse for that person and society so uh, I'm with them I'm with them on that um, okay. I like his lead on this one. Okay. What do you think? Excellent. Oh, yeah, yeah. I definitely think that decriminalizing on the user end is the way to go. Uh, because how else are you going to treat this epidemic, you know, the op opioid epidemic? You know, just throwing everybody in jail, that doesn't solve anything. You don't exactly. learn anything from it. You don't get any data or any inf information from it. So it's a lose-lose uh, if you take that approach. I think overall he did a good job. I measured based upon how much I think it's going to attract more people to his his campaign. And uh, I definitely think it will. I do think he had lost certain opportunities to discuss more about how UBI works. Um, you know, he brought the VAT once. He didn't describe exactly how it works and who it would or would not affect. He didn't talk about other 
policies that he has, uh, for example, um, he's against Citizens United. And this is one of the things I've noticed about Andrew Yang is the UBI seems to out overshadow everything else. And yes, it's true. He has a nice website, but unfortunately, vast majority of people will not go to that website and look through each one of those. Vast majority of people go to people like us or go to mainstream media to tell them because they're busy people. They've got a busy life. They don't have time to read a whole book online. But that's some of the, the points that he missed out on. And I really would like to see him start to bring those out a little more so people can see he's more than just UBI. Yeah, I, UBI seems to be like a, a big umbrella uh, for right. for Andrew Yang. So it's like it right. covers so much territory that he just stuffs everything under the umbrella of UBI. So, but yeah, I, I'd like to see him bring up a lot more uh, different policies to just just to exercise his diversity uh, with policies. He has over how many does he have on his website? Is literally close uh, to eighty or ninety now. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So it's like. It's not like he doesn't have anything to choose from, uh, but yeah, I'd like to see him uh, change it up a little. Going on to uh, what I think personally was the strongest performance of that night uh, on, over on Fox News, Bernie Sanders' town hall. Bernie killed it. Are you kidding me? Yeah. That was a bloodbath. <laughs> that was so, oh my God, everything Fox tried, because obviously it's Fox, so they're going to try to like frame him in bad lighting and just be disingenuous the whole night and... He wasn't having any of it. He, he was snapping back. I mean, Bernie is crankety, is cranky and crotchety uh, mm -hmm. most of the time anyways, but he was even more so then with his comebacks, and he did not give them an inch. Uh, and, right. you know, he just laid it on the American people. It was beautiful. Yeah. Uh, any major highlights that stuck out in your mind? Um, he called out Donald Trump. Uh, he called out Fox News. Uh, he wanted just just – Taking that moment in was just awesome to know that was Fox News and it was on Fox News uh, that Bernie called him out was just an awesome moment in time. And he said mm -hmm. they asked Bernie about his tax returns. He's like, why don't you get Trump on here and have him release 10 years right. of tax returns, which right, Bernie right. did. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was just an awesome moment. It was interesting how they kept trying to frame him into a hypocrite, you know, trying to smear him like, OK, so if you're for this, you know, progressive tax system. Why don't you go ahead and give away your portion, your fair share uh, right now? What are you waiting for? You know, yeah, no. that, that, was, that was so, funny. yeah, he did. Um, <laughs> I thought that was funny. It was, but, good. Um, oh, it was so good. But uh, it does speak to um, a bigger tactic that they like to use um, on over at Fox, where they essentially try to ad hominem you into uh, being a hypocrite. You know, why don't you walk to work? You know, right, yeah. burn fuel. Why don't you pay taxes now? I'm trying to come up with a term for it, but it basically reminds me of arguing for a crumb, but missing the, the you know, the whole meal. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like it's a systemic problem. You know, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking right. about what one person does on their own personal life as though that's going to change the whole world. You know, so, yeah, the scope in which which they are looking at right. these issues is so micro and it's such a large, vast, uh, complicated issue. And they're just ignoring that and they're not even getting into it. But they'll focus on that little crumb that you mentioned. And it's exactly, just one exactly. little thing there. Yeah. And it's just it's so remarkably disingenuous. And, you know, it fools a lot of people and, and they re you know, they just frame the narrative in these really myopic ways. And it wins that side over. I find it unbelievable. But the crowd it really surprised me more than anything else. I mean, the the yeah. response was very positive. I mean, it, just it was amazing. I, I I I was that was the one thing I was shocked about the uh, the most was the crowd response was on Bernie's side, emphatically on his side. Mm -hmm. It was just kind of mm -hmm. like the, the Fox and News could tell they were just trying to win over. Uh, with their talking points and no one was buying it, no one was really going for it from from the crowd's uh side it was everything bernie said was just ro up roaring supply mm -hmm. roaring applause so it was like and we're talking about the heartland of, of the the rust belt you know bethlehem pennsylvania you know where you would expect a, a more conservative base coming out and yet right and you trump won pennsylvania by nine points right right okay, in yep. 2016 so and it, I think it speaks to something larger, which is, I believe people are 
becoming more awake about what does progressivism really means. You know, progressivism isn't left or right. Progressivism is how do we move the human condition forward? How do we improve the human condition? And how do we have equity, fairness, and justice, the environment, socially? That's what is progressivism. And that's why I think it appealed to people from throughout the political spectrum. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I see like progressivism, it, it bleeds over into the conservative and to like back in 2016, one in every 10 Trump voter was going to vote for Bernie if he got the nomination. Right, right. I mean, that's that's a little insight right there. Progressivism, some people may know in the audience, is rooted in populism. So that's where we basically get our roots from. So he was very forthright when he talked about what is dem democratic socialism. You know, I really thought okay. people were going to be all over that one and Fox News would jump all over him, take advantage of that. But yeah, I don't think Fox anticipated it to go that uh, great for Bernie. Like yeah. everything he said was just, you know, f I believe in people getting uh, opportunity and uh, a chance to do good. And it, it, everything he said about democratic socialism resonated with the audience and just blew mm -hmm. up in Fox News face. They tried to package it like, oh, yeah, let's try to let's bring up democratic socialism so we could lose on it. Nope. And, the, and there was a moment when Brett brought up uh, asking everybody to raise their hand. How many of you <laughs> have private insurance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was awesome. Yeah, the first, yeah, the first thing he, he said, everyone raise your hand uh, who has private health care insurance. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then like 80% of the crowd raised their hand. And then, okay, now how many of you would want to change over to Sanders uh, Medicare for all plan and that same 80% <laughs> raised their hand right, and just right. started hollering and, mm -hmm. and they just the crowd went nuts once yeah, again yeah. for the 80th time it blew up in Fox News face they tried to package these disingenuous arguments and framing and it all blew up in their face and it was beautiful i loved it oh i know one more highlight i think was very important uh, is when he talked about that it wasn't easy to go up against the corporate media, and he he said up against the the lobbyists, uh, the big money interest, and then he talked. He said the military industrial complex. Yeah. He says, yeah, it's not easy to go up against all those establishments. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that was beautiful. I was like, whoa. I know. It oh, feels like whoa, it is. Whoa, whoa. It, it just feels like Bernie and us against the world. Like it's felt yeah. that way since 2016. So it, like he framed it perfectly right there. And it even elicited a response from Donald Trump. And you know Donald Trump, he does not tweet unless he feels threatened with something. Oh, of course. Oh, yeah, yeah. Total reactionary. Otherwise, he just, you know, ignores it. Anyway. Oh, oh yeah, and then Bernie Sanders responded. This is what uh, Donald Trump says. I believe it will be crazy Bernie Sanders versus sleepy Joe Biden as the two finalists to run against maybe the best economy in the history of our country. Oh, boy. I look forward to facing whoever it may be. May God rest their soul. <laughs> and then Sanders responds, looks like President Trump is scared out of our campaign. He should be. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. Perfect. Wow. This is a new Brent, Bernie Sanders we haven't seen before. It's a new side to him. I love it. I know. He it's, quite it really is the Bernie Sanders he should have been in 2016. I think if he had been that Bernie Sanders, he would have beaten Clinton. I really do. Yeah. And well, the superdelegates were, or the, it was yeah. rigged. Like Hillary had the superdelegates lined up before it even yeah. started. But I mean, yeah, I know what you're saying. Like, you would have won yeah. many more people over. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that uh, town hall with Bernie Sanders? Bernie did say this. I want to run this by uh, He said, if we spend most of our time attacking Trump, Democrats are going to lose in 2020. And I thought that was very, very true. Even though he took his, 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 jabs on fox news there towards donald trump mm -hmm. uh, as a collective we have to be focused on the issues the issues is the only way to beat donald trump in 2020 i'm glad he said that on fox news yeah yeah he per pretty much hit all of the major points that i think are essential for people to understand where he's coming from absolutely absolutely so, so i think we both will agree that uh, his performance will enhance or grow his his uh, support I think it will. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he's going to get, like I said, he's going to get one out of every 10 conservative voter if he runs, if he gets the nomination. He's going mm -hmm. to score 
a good chunk of conservatives in 2020. That's my my opinion. Yeah, yeah, and I think he he got um, essentially back what he put into it. Like I think a lot of people are against him going to Fox News, but at the end of the day, I think it was a wise move. Yeah, I was all for it. I'm glad he did it. it it's going to pay off if he becomes the nomination. I mean, when he becomes the nomination. All right, so that's uh, Dave and I's take on the town hall. So, Dave, I appreciate you being here, and we'll see you just shortly as Dave has um, been nice enough to, to meet again today on a few other topics. So look for that coming up in the next couple of days, Progressive Talk number three. Thanks, Dave, for joining us again. Thank you, Josh. You're welcome. See you soon.